over the back and pull yourself up. Oh, you're right. Throw on this. Uh. <laughs> 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 a bar stool is a bar stool, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's the way it goes. Right, you ready? We're good. We're on. Oh, well, then everybody got to watch us on video struggling under the chair. Oh, well. Anyway, thanks That's the human side of writing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all so much for coming out tonight, and we had a little early Valentine's Day treat today. But it's always a treat to welcome the Todds, either one or both Todds. Tonight we scored both Todds, Absolutely. Charles and Carol. So, gosh, how many times have we done this now? I don't know, but I'm getting to really love Scott's Day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you almost died from the Tucson Book Festival. Remember yeah, that? You're, that? You were so year. sick. Oh, I was so sick, and I got up and I signed all those books. You did. Right. Gave everybody my terms. <laughs> we, we went no, out to dinner and left her behind. You old people <laughs> that we were. But um, it was the Tucson Book Festival in March, and you know sometimes the pollen and everything can really do you in if you're if you're not used to it. But happily, it's so cold out right now. Nothing's <laughs> actually flowering. I mean, the doctor kept asking me, "Are you allergic to juniper pollen?" I don't know. We don't have that many junipers in them. And I had to say, "Well, I, I have no idea." He gave me a Claritin tin. So it must have been the Jennifer Pollen. Who knew? <laughs> However, so speaking of landscapes, this book is a really exciting one. Um, Standing Stones, which is always, I think, mysterious and wonderful. Except these are not Stonehenge, but rather Avebury. Or oh, do you pronounce yeah. it differently? Avebury. It is Avebury. Mm -hmm. So what possessed you guys to go to Avebury? Well, we had gone there. Um, I had gone there with my husband years before. And then it was 78, I think it was. Yeah. 80. <laughs> we took Charles, and I think we took you back again around 2000, and we went back on. But we always had another book that we were busy writing, and we kept saying, well, we'll get back to Avebury. But this time... We love Salisbury Plain anyway. Uh, we yes. were talking about it. Uh, the picture of Caroline up here is uh, her sighting uh, the pale horse, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that chalk drawing is on a hillside near Swindon as well. Mm -hmm. Salisbury, uh, on the Salisbury Plain area, you've got Stonehenge, Avebury, and the, the pale horse, or the Uffington white horse is the proper term. Yeah. Is there a theory why those two sets of standing stones are on the Salisbury Plain? I mean, because there, there are a lot of them in France where they call them dolmens, I think, in Brittany and so forth. That's but right. why the Salisbury Plain? Um, this whole area from from um, Wiltshire on up. It just seems to be a place where early man decided to to build forts and, and, and villages. And nobody knows why some of these, why these were dedicated to something or something that we don't know about. But I obviously it had a religious significance. I think part of it too, you know, Stonehenge is set in such a way that they can tell time is kind of their calendar, uh, the way the sun lines up with the stones during the different equinox and solstices. And so on that plane, it, it is more flat. Right. And you, you can see for a pretty fair distance and uh, that, that worked extremely well because in the archeological work they'd done, they found that there weren't any major villages or towns around Stonehenge. There were places where workmen stayed and ate and did the work, but <clears throat> so they came there specifically to put these standing stones. And, and there's one, uh, when we were doing Hadrian's Wall, we stopped at one set of standing stones up mm -hmm. in the northern part of England. Oh, what, they would hinge. We stopped at Woodhenge. Mm -hmm. But it goes all the way up into Scotland and into the Isles. Mm -hmm. There are these, these standing stones. So whatever brought these people to England at this particular period, uh, this was good country possibly for, for stock. Um, there were hills that people could fortify, little bitty ones by uh, Scottsdale's <laughs> view of what a hill ought to be. But they could fortify, and there are some um, uh, signs that this had been done. There were graves out there. Uh, next to Avebury, there's a whole, it's called the Marlborough Plain. 
and you go out in it, and there are lots of little dimples. They look like dimples, but you know, Windmill Hill and some of the old barrows where people were worshiping or were buried. Mm. So it's, it's just a, a, a treasure trove of this. I'm sure the it nice is. The nice thing about Avebury, though, is unlike Stonehenge, which after it got vandalized, they put up all these fences around there, so you're right. looking from a distance, there's a tour buses everywhere. Mm -hmm. Avebury is kind of off the beaten track, and you can actually walk out in the grass and touch the stones, and, and it's uh, a lot more realistic. Uh, I can do this without bringing it down. It's on the cover, right? In the circle is the little town of Avebury. Village, really? Village. It's just town. tiny. Very small. Uh, there's a couple of co postcard places, some shops, and that some houses, and that's pretty much all that's there. But the town itself is half in, half out of the circle of stones, and the main road going into town enters into the, the stone circle. You drive right through it to, to get to, to the town. So it is a combination of modern uh, village modern and 1600. <laughs> uh, the ancient uh, stones all intertwined together so it, it, it creates an atmosphere that we thought was pretty unique. Most of these are like any of the dolmens you see. They're great chunks of rock that they dug out of the chalk and somehow made stand up without any engineering. Remember they dug these out with antlers from deer. That was their spade. But this particular one right here, if you go up to it, this is the back side. If you go up to it and look up and it looks like like something that Michelangelo or or um oh, I can't think of his name all of a sudden in um in France and oh, yeah. Yeah. Burgers of Calais, uh, Rodin. Mm -hmm. Rodin. Yeah. Um, it looks like a hooded figure mm -hmm. with a face looking down at you. Mm -hmm. When you stand there and the way the shadows hit it, it it's, it's, it's not creepy, it's not scary, but it's, it, you sort of feel the difference in this particular mm -hmm. one, and that's what... It was a little, at the first time I went there, it was at sunset late in the day and the sun was going down and the, the shadows were casting kind of odd and it was always kind of um, that whole area is kind of a mystical place. Well, well I that asked you that sorry, let me just that. I asked you that question way back because because it's so flat it couldn't be fortified so it almost mm -hmm. cries out that it was a religious rather than um, mm -hmm. yeah. a living arrangement because there wasn't any way to protect That's it. That's right. They probably pitched tents when they came for ceremony. Right. But there were 600 and some odd stones. And for a long time, people would dig them up and take them off to use in their, their barn or their house. And a lot of the stones in Avebury, especially where the town enters into the stone circle, are completely gone from where they were chipped up and mm -hmm. turned into. Well, the same thing happened with Hadrian's Wall. Uh, there are whole chunks of the wall that were missing that people used to uh, lay out and mark their property and build barns and uh, cots. Yeah, for but the this sheep. kind of vandalism is not unique to that. When last time I was in Peru, my daughter and I flew over the Nazca lines, which you've seen. Oh, yeah. you know? mm -hmm. They they drilled the Pan American Highway right through it, yeah. and so some of the lines, in fact, have been. And then there was a trucker or something that decided to do some vandalizing, but. Um, I'm not surprised that the village is in the stone circle and all Just those rocks like standing those there. Ones. Why dig up more? Right. They're right there. <laughs> but I brought the whole thing up because what an amazingly good place to put a body. Oh. <laughs> right. So there's one at the foot. Is it of the hooded stone? Yes. Oh, absolutely. That's what I thought. <laughs> absolutely. Carolyn would never waste the hooded to do stone. Do it well. <laughs> That's right. And so that, that really is the um, thing that kicks off the story, is the discovery of the body. Yes, and here's the body with no identification. They don't know how this person got there. They don't know where this person came from. 
They don't know where the killer went. They don't know. Obviously, the they're not a local, so mm -hmm. nobody in the town has ever seen this person mm -hmm. before. Mm -hmm. So, when you have a body and nothing to go on, perfect for Rutledge, you know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he can come in and. and Way oh, before really? facial recognition. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. No CSI in yeah. this one. No. You know, but that's part of the fun of writing them, isn't it? That you it can is. actually put a body at the foot of the stone. And, Absolutely. Uh, and nobody has any idea who it is or where it came from. So that's a big part of the investigation first, is to figure out whose body, as Dorothy right. Sayers would say, yeah, whose body? Whose body? Where did she come from? Oh, I didn't mention it was a she. Well, I just threw that in just in case. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But the, the most important thing is, if you're um, a, a policeman, where do you start when you've got a corpse and no name, nobody recognizes it? Um, it photography wasn't killed was possible, in any kind of ritual fashion, so yeah. there was no, there was nothing about the way that she was murdered that indicated any kind of association with the stones and the meaning of the stones. But well, Rutledge has the, to find that out for himself. No. He does have to find it out for himself, <laughs> but it, it, it doesn't start out with, with you know, somebody draped over a stone slash. For druids or whatever. Yeah. But actually, druids. to be really fair, it's not Rutledge who was first called to this crime scene. Yes. Who was it? Say that again. It wasn't Rutledge. No. Who was first called to the crime scene? We have used this a couple of times because in in one of the books, the original inspector um, had a heart attack and died. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Rutledge had to step in and figure out <laughs> what he had put in the notes in his head instead of in the notes mm -hmm. in his in his pocket. And Rutledge had to reinvestigate and find out what he had seen there what he was going to do. In this one, we thought, well, what if Rutledge is punished and sent to, to a scene where his, uh, his um, uh, chief superintendent knows he's going to fail? What if it's designed for Rutledge mm -hmm. to fail? Mm -hmm. And that was an interesting thing to explore. We like to explore different aspects of We've really set up that chief superintendent to be an absolute jerk. I mean, well, a lot of them are. We've set up you a couple of them like that, you know? Right. Well, just well, well, because well. Bowles is gone doesn't mean that all the troubles have gone uh, with them. No, but isn't, in, in point of fact, even um, even then, but certainly in a lot of modern police procedural novels and policing novels, the conflict between mm. the cops, between the you know various investigating bodies or the officers or detectives themselves, is a big part of the plot because conflict is important yeah. to drive a plot, right? Well, the, the thing is, Rutledge is coming in as the new kid on the block. He represents educated policemen who are slowly but surely taking the place of where they have to come up through the ranks, as you have seen in Endeavor and all. But he is a different breed from the the um, sort of floor middle class guy who who's the Bobby on the beat. The Bobby on the beat who has limited education, limited experience. And a lot of resentment was there because you say, well, you know, I paid my dues as the Bobby on the beat. Whereas Rutledge did his time as a Bobby on the beat, so to speak, in London, but it was very brief. He was fast tracked. Yeah. And that was the intent at the time. But uh, Naturally, the, the older generations that had come up the old-fashioned way by their bootstraps didn't particularly appreciate these. Sure, mm -hmm. literally by their kids. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So, how far away from the war have we moved now? Because you've been going quite slowly with this investigation. Yes. <laughs> Some of them start immediately after the previous one, which a great degree is true in this, right? Yes, this it's one 1920. Is a, so it's only 1920. Yeah, you know, I'm getting to the point that. Careful, yeah, um, look it up yourself. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Page one, chapter one. <laughs> <laughs> but I like the thing. February 21. I okay. thought it was 21. 21? Yeah, right. But to really, you know, to really mm -hmm. keep Hamish alive and to make a lot of the things that have made this series interesting, you can't move very far away mm -hmm. from the war. Mm -hmm. um, and I think. 
Mysteries don't have to move in real time. You know, you well, can it'd it. be kind of dull. It, you know, it, it, if if we weren't careful, this is the twenty second in the Rutledge series, and if we had been careful, Rutledge would be eighty five, <laughs> fifty. And, yeah, it would have been another war, and yeah, you know, the whole thing. So I I really like the fact that years ago I remember reading. I read Lindsay Davis's wonderful Falco books, and I read them out of order, because I read Shadows and Bruns, the second one, first. And it began to dawn on me that it clearly started like the minute after the first book, which was something silver, I can't remember the full title, had ended. So I went back and read the first, Silver Pigs. For the first time I had read, I tried to read Silver Pigs, I wasn't that engaged in it. Oftentimes, first novels have a lot of setup in them, yes, and they're not yes. as interesting. I love Shadows and Bronze of this character. So then I went back and read with Silver Pigs and realized, really, they're just one book. They're just one story because there is no time separation between them. You know, and I like that. I mean, that's how real life would go. If you're a policeman, you didn't get like a month off after you completed the case, right? It doesn't happen then. Yeah. Well, you want to walk, the, the, the funny thing is, is that you're trying to walk a fine line. On the one hand, you want any reader to be able to pick up this book exactly. as their first book and not be completely mm -hmm. lost. You don't want to bore to tears the person who's read 21 of them and is now starting number 22 but at the same time for those people who do like to read the books in order mm -hmm. uh, yeah. each mystery has some form of impact on Rutledge as a person mm -hmm. that leads him from one case to the next and it's it's subtle enough that if you if you choose to read them in order you will pick up on it, but if you pick up the book out of order, right. you're, you're, you're not going to be missing something critical. And you've done a very subtle job giving him a little bit of a personal life. There's not mm -hmm. a lot. Mostly, it was Hamish, but then there's a woman or two that has, you know, I mean, he's been, human. <laughs> been in and out. Um, and it's his story as well as a mystery. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, one of the things I liked about the Sherlock Holmes books and, and also Poirot and, and the classics was the fact that you got to know the, the detective and and understand with, with Poirot, it was what he had left behind in Belgium and the fact that he was in a different country and different um, way of looking at things. With 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 um, Conan Doyle, you could see how this man could think and how he prioritized different things. I mean, but they, you also they came got, into life. What was her name, Mrs. Hudson? and. Mm -hmm. um, right. Sherlock Holmes. I liked her. I thought she was a pretty neat character. <laughs> I enjoyed right. seeing her, her well, she's show She's been an old lady in one and series and a young woman. <laughs> <laughs> but speaking of Poirot, any of you watched the John Malkovich's um, Poirot? Um, it's a retelling of... Well, you know, what I thought was um, really interesting was, um, and I don't remember it in the Christie, but I might have just forgotten it, that you discover eventually that Poirot was a priest in a Belgian village. He was no. Catholic and a priest, and his village was slaughtered by the Germans. Uh -huh. And that is sent him to England. And I don't know, does, was that any no. of your real Christie no. scholars? No. I he don't recall. Policeman. No. I'm just telling you that in the Malkovich, you know, on TV, <laughs> and it's interesting because all of this is licensed by the Christie estate. So um, they must have been okay with it. But they kept having flashbacks during the series. Um, and you would see you know, Poirot is a young man, but you never really could see that he was wearing a Roman Catholic collar. And, you know, what he was flashing back to was the death of this young boy. And then everybody was bundled in the church and they set the church on fire and killed them. And that's the big trauma that has sent him. It was the ABC murders. It's that, yeah. that version of it. It was on Netflix, I think. Yeah. But I think, I mean, in a way, I, I'm not sure that I like taking liberties, you know, with Agatha Christie's Poirot. Um, did you all have, are you just laughing over there? But <laughs> No, we're just making sure we make note of it. Oh, okay. <laughs> great. Um, you know, I, and there have been, in, in some of the homes and other classics that they are now refilming with more modern casts, there have been some queer alterations or additions or interpretations, you know, that didn't necessarily 
or not necessarily true to the original. I don't know if I would want that for Rutledge, but then I'm still alive. So. After you're dead, you're all, <laughs> um, you can take care of that by, you know, your literary executor can not license um, anybody to to write or Are produce books. <laughs> no, you um, can. I, I, yeah. I give that advice to a lot of authors, because some of them will sit here and say, nobody's ever going to write, you know, and I say, well, there's an actual way you can prevent it, but you have to make a will, and you have to appoint a literary executor and make sure, in point of fact, that this can't happen. The Christie estate lives off the incredible revenue. She's probably worth much more now than she ever was when she was alive and making a very modest uh -huh. amount of money per book. Right? That was a fun thing this year. Uh, a lot of times when we go to England, we go to a conference, whether it's uh, Crime Fest in Bristol or this Paradise. year we're going to uh, Capital Crime in London. Last year we went to Harrogate and we right. stayed in the hotel where she Agatha Christie disappeared. Yeah. And uh, boy, I'll be where glad to get air was. conditioning. You know, oh. 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 England for some reason, you, you always get in your mind, you're thinking, oh gee, it's going to be. Well, one time we were there in May and I, we were in, in southern England and so I pack my sweaters and my long sleeve shirts, and you know I get there and it's 80 degrees. <laughs> and, you know, I was roasting. There's very low air conditioning in England. But you know, well, they may have improved it. <laughs> no, they have. There's a film <laughs> where um, oh, I can't think of the American actor who finds Christie and interviews her when she's hiding. Or she walks along with Seafront quite often. <laughs> there are, Harrogate is a lovely, lovely city with hills all over the place. No sea in sight. No. It's in the middle of Yorkshire, and it's a spa town, um, which is why there yeah. is the big hotel there. And there. Well, we can rest as we often do. Um, but that's the fun of I know. No, it's always, it always fun to, to talk about all that. Anyway, Avery was clearly sort of a gift to you guys. Um, yes. Some of your settings. Are, are there, but they're not always necessarily a gift for the story. I mean, I love the different places that you go, and usually they help shape the story. Well, yeah. we had a lot of locations in the Black Ascot, which was the right. one before this. There were a lot of little tidbits that we got to throw in, hmm. like the... the I, I, I'm always careful not to do a spoiler. <laughs> <laughs> um, but some historical things that we could sneak in here and there that uh, are a lot of fun. But, you know, as you know, Rutledge went all over the place. Oh, yeah. Well, that's the great thing about working for Scotland Yard, you know, because you have a nationwide forbid mm -hmm. and he can be called in He's the FBI. anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I thought the one that you wrote in Cambridgeshire, the Fens, you know, where the oh, um, dies at the cathedral and so forth, that was one where the, the actual landscape and the in the buildings you know played into the hunting shadows right and we climbed up to the roof of that building to see if it was possible oh <coughs> what do you think could throw a body off it <laughs> no not to throw or a body off but to shoot somewhere yeah, yeah. 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 love those three writers it'd be hard to travel with them <laughs> 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 why are you going up in some pretty strange places i have to admit yeah but that's such an important part of your well, I was, this last trip, we were in northern Wales, and I was 500 feet below the ground in a slate mine. Oh, yeah. It was that beautiful the best down book? there. Oh, yeah. That was the best mm. book, right? Um, it's not in a book yet. We just That's the book there. we just turned in. <laughs> oh, okay. But best was in Wales. Um, <laughs> southern Wales. Wales. She was yeah. in southern Wales. But okay. this trip, we, we, uh, we started in Harrogate and went down um, to... Uh, Stratford on Avon and then, mm -hmm. then meandered across the Cotswold and went over to North Wales and uh, we're down in a uh, slate mine and uh, it's it's absolutely it was astounding I, I had I a fabulous that. time mm -hmm. to, you know, but crawling around in a slate mine is it, not if you're claustrophobic I don't recommend it <laughs> yeah. I'm claustrophobic but I didn't have I went to a different mine, and <clears throat> we had our slickers and the miners' hats and, and the boots and all, and 
You could go down to Bisbee, Arizona and do this. Yeah. And the copper mine. Have mm -hmm. you done that? The I mine. love they, it. They, yeah. know, they dress you up in the whole, the whole deal. I've been in a diamond mine like that, yeah. a gold mine. So mm -hmm. before we leave Bess, since I digressed over there, um, that conversation we had about how fast you move, Rutledge is, although you've done a um, prequel or so, we're after the war and we're moving in that direction. Okay. But with Bess, you know from the beginning that the war is progressing and at some point it's going to end. It's and it then what is it. going to happen mm -hmm. to Bess? So it's a different, there's like a ticking clock in the background of the Bess books all the way through. Um, this last book that came out, um, Cruel, Cruel Deception, Deception yeah. took place at the um, peace treaty uh, negotiation. Treaty of Versailles conference. Outside of and Paris, but yeah. The, the, the neat thing was, since Bess was in the war, we wanted to have her see the peace. The armistice mm -hmm. in 1918 <clears throat> was really just a cessation of hostilities. That was not a... It was the ceasefire. Right. right. And so we wanted her to have some feeling for what was going to happen. So now, Bess is going to do something really interesting. She's going to Ireland and getting herself involved in the troubles. Mm -hmm. oh. <laughs> oh, there's a little war going on. This is oh, very yeah. rare. <laughs> We've been hanging around Ruth Dudley Edwards. I can bit. see. Too <laughs> long. Too much. Right. You're going to be like um, the guy. Oh, Lord. I'm having, I'm sorry. I'm really out of it this evening. I had dental surgery this morning. So oh. I have a chauffeur because I <laughs> took a pain pill in order to come down here. <laughs> and I didn't think I wanted to drive. Um, I'm trying to think the guy that wrote that the first espionage book essentially turned out he um the one that's set in the Frisian area is still comes to be quite a famous book but basically it's considered the first espionage novel and he was irish and he was a decorated hero and all this other stuff and then he went back to ireland and britain shot him for being a traitor that's right and that's the reason he only wrote one book <laughs> that's exactly right. It's a true story, which I find fascinating. There were a lot of men that served in World War One, and because mm -hmm. of the, the uprising that happened during the war, um, we got a lot of written first-hand accounts and second-hand accounts of family members where they would literally come home and take off their uniform and their medals and everything and, and either burn it or hide it. Um, <laughs> Oh. Because they didn't want it known that, because their fellow Irishmen saw them as traitors. Well, Redmond and, had said at the beginning yeah. of the troubles, mm -hmm. the beginning of the war, Parliament passed the bill for home rule and then turned around and tabled it for the duration of the war. And Redmond said, "Go and serve the British and show them that we are loyal to the crown." But then after the sixteen uprising when um, uh, these men were hanged for their, their role in the uprising, the people in Ireland felt awful about uh, what had happened to these men and hated the men who had served. And Bess is going to walk right into this problem. <laughs> where, where because she goes, this is right at the time when the men are coming home or have just um, recently right. come home. So now I'm going to prove to you that when you get old, your memory doesn't disappear. It just takes a long time to access it <laughs> because the name of the author is Ernest Childers, C-H-I-L-D-E-R-S, who wrote this book. And you know what? It's a really interesting book. Um, and where they go in it's in the North Sea, in the marshes up um, above at Holland and Belgium, right along the North Sea. That's where my husband's family Do you remember the name of the, the Riddle of the Sands? Sands. Thank Riddle you. Riddle. I looked at you, right? The Riddle from, of the Sands. See, I'm just proving They were from Bremen, which is up near Denmark. Denmark. That's Friesland up in there. Yeah. That's really but it's really a nifty story, and um, and a lot of it is naval, because um, he was a naval guy. So um, if you're at all interested in historical fiction or espionage fiction, I really recommend The Riddle of the Sands. I've read it at least twice and really enjoyed it. What was the title again? The Riddle of the Sands. Um, and, you know, they do, um, without GPS and all, they're over there to kind of map out this very marshy, lots of tributaries territory for the British Navy. So it's great. Anyway, let's go back to Rutledge. I mean, yeah. <laughs> the rest. Um, they find the body in at the foot. The body is found, discovered, at the foot of the interesting hooded stone. And one Scotland Yard detective comes and one Scotland Yard detective goes and then Rutledge is sent there by his superior as kind of punishment. 
they, they, they first man couldn't find the material that he needed, any information, clues, um, whatever, and they left it as an open case. And because Rutledge does something else elsewhere that is similar to this, his boss says, we'll send Rutledge to solve the case that, that the other man couldn't, mm -hmm. and he will fail, and it'll be an excuse mm -hmm. to, get rid of to get rid of him. Actually, isn't there a resignation letter He's got in a, resignation a drawer from, yeah. that yeah. they can pull out if yeah. he really screws up? That's, That's right. kind of a hangover mm -hmm. in part from the Black House. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So <clears throat> what does Rutledge do? He knows, he's fairly well aware of the fact that this is what is to be his fate. But Rutledge is nothing if not tenacious, and he wants to find out how this how this happened. And he goes about it in very interesting, innovative ways. That uh, I'm not sure what it says that both of our protagonists are very stubborn people. Write <laughs> <laughs> what you know, Charles. <laughs> right there. I also really liked the side trip to shop to Shropshire, which is the place where I've spent a fair amount of time. It's where Ellis Peters, Edith Perjit, or Peter oh, yeah. in Shropshire, and I went to visit her several times. And so I was glad that you made a little digression. Up and there. we do a little bit more in this next book. Oh, good. We go to Catfell's Abbey. Oh, oh you do? Yes, we went there. And, and I've been there before, right. but uh, it was a rainy day and atmospheric and mm -hmm. there's nothing of Cadfell here. Left. No, sadly no. not. I Except Saint, what's her name? I can't, Withenberger. She's a Welsh saint. Ethelred. No, it's not Ethelred. Ethelred was the unready. Yeah, he was, right. <laughs> I'm clearly too. Um, <laughs> right. Is she the one that in um, A Morbid Taste for Bones that Brother Kevin went to Wales and brought her back, right? Yeah, I, 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 um, I think it's either she's the same one or that's where he just got the, the idea. The idea, it is. right. Yeah, so you... you that's one of my all-time favorite series. If you guys have never read the Brother Cadvale books, I don't think they are currently in print. They're, they might be in digital, but I'm sure you can find them anywhere. Yeah. It's way better to read them in order, so you should start with a morbid taste for bones. And they but she did lovely, modern, well, in her day, modern. As Edith Berger. Yes. Um, and then she favorite. wrote the Heaven Tree trilogy, which is um, a, a, it's actually a medieval Da Vinci Code. It's absolutely terrific. It is marvelous. Right. So give, the Heaven the Tree. Plug. Right. The Heaven Tree trilogy. And right. my favorite of her quote unquote modern mysteries is The Knocker on Death's Door. And uh, that is really a, a wonderful, wonderful book. I like the one where they found the Trojan Horde buried oh, yeah. somewhere mm -hmm. in Wales. Mm -hmm. I just love that. Yeah. We're going to have a Trojan race. Horde sometime around, but I haven't gotten there yet. Yeah. So you guys just have a wonderful time traveling around England, finding interesting spots, getting Rutledge in trouble. What's going on with Hamish? I don't, he's not well, he's always still very much there. Place. I know, but he sort of ebbs and flows a bit, doesn't it he? It depends well, on if you what he brings out. It kind of ebbs and flows throughout the series. Some, it, a lot of it depends on what Rutledge is dealing with, how great a role he plays in, in the plot. Mm -hmm. uh, and Obviously, he doesn't go away. He's still there. I think there are a lot of fans out there that would... Yeah, it's a funny thing because so many people come up to us and say, well, you know, we'd like to see Rutledge get better and be happy. Oh, wait a minute. You'd have to get rid of Hamish, wouldn't you? Never mind. <laughs> I didn't think it's a Rutledge's nature to be happy necessarily. I think he could be a little more at peace. But Hamish is basically represents... Him. PTSD. And, and the stress levels bring right. this. Uh, with PT, real PTSD, right. the stress level um, produces episodes. And so you will have Hamish representing. I mean, we really wanted to talk about PTSD when we started working on the war series because for a long time it was thought to be a shame and a disgrace. Mm -hmm. and. We know somebody who came back from Vietnam and had to face the the, the, people. Yeah. the people throwing rocks and cursing yeah. them and, and things like that. And if you ever have been in a deep jungle and saw what those men had to face, right or wrong about the war, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. If you saw what those men had to face and then come home and to be treated the way they were, it wasn't their fault that they were there. It, 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 if you have to blame somebody, you blame whoever 
was I behind have a it. Very good friend who was a tunnel rat mm -hmm. along the Ho Chi Minh yeah. Trail. Mm -hmm. You know, flashlight and a forty-five, and they mm -hmm. basically drop you in by the ankles and off you, know, you it's go. It's a tourist attraction. I didn't go. I um, didn't. Know. Yeah, when we were in Vietnam, we had an opportunity because they actually had like a tunnel tour. I thought, no, you know, I'm not doing that. So you, you know, you this van. That I'm in particular that I'm talking about um, had a, a bomb or, or some explosive device go off and hit his head. <clears throat> he woke up six months later in San Diego in a hospital. Had no idea. One minute he was walking through the jungle, the next minute he was in a hospital. And he didn't find out until later when he was having headaches and they had to find out through x-ray why he was having headaches, had a steel plate in his head. But he had nightmares. And my daughter was there one night when he had nightmares. And he came awake in, around one o'clock in the morning, couldn't find his rifle. And he was yelling to his men, he couldn't find the rifle, but he wanted them to do this, he wanted them to do that. Racing through the house, screaming, he could obviously hear firing. All these things were going on the next morning he had no memory of what he had done. Kept everybody else terrified mm -hmm. because they didn't know what was going on. I mean, he did this night after night after night. And when you see something like this, it's, it's, I've seen other people with PTSD. I and think the most important thing was because of that experience is why it was so vital to us not to have it be a giving. You remember, Tessa Wells came out in 96. This was long before... In 96, they weren't calling it PTSD. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was long before 9-11 when all of that vernacular started showing up in, in ordinary conversation. Uh, and so it was very important to us to make sure that we wanted to bring up the subject but do it in a thoughtful way that shows some respect to the, the men that we knew that had dealt with it. And it, it, all of that's very well, and I think you do it very well, but I also have to say it's an extremely useful device um, in the books because you are able to create another voice and another perspective, you know, where he calls, you know, when Rutledge is about to step into it or whatever. Well, um, so he's, you he's know, a really and useful character. Doing the Rutledge series, it, you know, and, and a lot of the later uh, Scotland Yard inspectors that go out, they'll take the sergeant with them. So they have that interaction that sort of gives you an idea of their Watson, so to speak, to give you an idea of what the uh, protagonist is thinking. And yet, right after World War One. They barely had enough inspectors to send out, much less send out two people. And so Rutledge traveled along. What about the movie 1917? Is that um, likely to affect your, your writing? Um, did you like it? Did you find it? I loved it. I mean, it was. That and They Shall Not Grow Old, those two oh, combined. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they Shall Not Grow Old was, was a fantastic yeah. movie. Um, and then uh, 1917. I'm glad I went to see it. It was extremely well done, but it was a hard movie to watch. It's not as gory as, no. as I had expected. So if you want to go, you don't have to worry about awful things. You can see that, you know, bodies here and, and things like that. It's not like a slasher film or anything. <laughs> right. But it, it's, it's, it shows what those men really went through. It was a horrible war. Yeah, it really it, was. It really I was. mean, was. all wars are horrible, but the, the, the whole trench warfare thing was I, particularly awful. I think. There was like one historian who yeah. made a, an interesting comment. He said, World War I was the price we paid for the Industrial Revolution mm -hmm. because it was due to the Industrial Revolution and the ability to mass produce things. Even in the American Civil War, something as simple as a screw was not easy to mass produce, and so parts were an interchangeable. Uh, towards mm -hmm. the end of the war, Gatling and then the Gatling gun, but it was a very different concept from uh, 
the machine guns that they were using in uh, in World War One, but suddenly we had the industrial capacity to produce complex weapons in a very large number, and we're very good at it. Yeah. The, the self-recoiling artillery and the rifled artillery, uh, in and of itself, uh, I hate to be redundant, but. The reason it was called shell shock was that during World War I, it was the first war that the explosive shells were filled with high explosives because of Nobel and, and the uh, use of cordite, etc. So when these shells exploded, the, the explosion was so rapid it actually breaks the sound barrier and sends out a concussion wave. Mm -hmm. and it is literally a shock wave that comes out from the shell. Prior to World War I, even in the American Civil War, you had the Napoleon-style cannon. You'd fire it, it would roll back to recoil, and then you'd have to re-aim, muzzle load. By World War I, they had the self-recoiling gun, so the gun did not move. The barrel recoiled on in place, like the modern artillery we have today. And they were breech loading, which meant that you had cartridges so that you could just open the back, shove in another shell, slam and shut, pull the lanyard, and you had the ability to drop shells repeatedly, one after the other, right on the same location, over and over and over and over. And these guys were standing in these trenches for months and months with no no way to the natural human instinct with that type of thing is to run and yet you're trapped in a trench and if you try to get out there are machine guns and snipers that are going to stop you and so this prolonged exposure to that concussive effect was phenomenal the it also caused what was called the uh, acoustic shadow which they had started to see in the american civil war but uh at the front, you could hear the shells very loud, but a short distance back from the front, you didn't hear it at all, and yet, for example, during the bombardment of the Battle of the Somme, they could hear the guns firing in London. Yeah. Oh. And the, the really interesting thing, in, in going back to 1917, there are places where these two guys walk through an area where there are just mountains of shells, empty casings, and you see that, and that represents just exactly what he was was talking about. That this is where they were just firing them as fast as they could, a whole line of them, and the shells came. I have one of the the um, of the shell cases. It was brought to you from England somehow. <laughs> I found We're not it going in a, into great detail on that one. I found it in a, a, a an antique shop in um, Rochester. And I went in, I'm staying with my friends, um, Brian and Pauline, and I went in and I looked at it. And I came back out, Brian had been um, in the British Army. So I said, go in and look at that and tell me if it's real. So he went in and he looked at it and he said, yes, mm -hmm. the things I had seen were. And I said, now, how the heck do I get that thing home? I mean, can you imagine going through TSA? <laughs> he said, don't worry about it. Hmm. When he came over with Pauline the next time, he had what is like a, a baby pack on his back, and he had all sorts of the things that they would need for the trip itself. There, and all around it was the shell. And nobody in England thought twice about it, and it got here as safe and sound. And what year was this? Hmm? What year was this? Uh, this was let's see. Three oh, years ago. Oh, so oh, relatively yeah. recently. <laughs> Three or four years ago. Well, it's longer than that, but yet close. How do you think it was on the shelf? It's, oh, this it is, stands about that tall yeah, and it's about that big around. Oh, they come in different it. sizes. Yeah. They made they made vases yeah. out of some of yeah. them for the soldiers in the hospital to work on. They engraved them. They made lighters. I have a lighter made out of a uh, yeah. rifle <laughs> shell. You can make a bell out of it. Yeah. yeah. And, and L but actually, like, during the war itself, it was... It was against military regulations to do that kind of thing with the shells. That doesn't mean it wasn't done, but it was because they were recycling the brass back to England as fast as they possibly could to melt it down and create another one. 
Uh, I, I made this thing. I didn't wear it. Um, Carol and I and I have a. In the center of the shell is a little brass fuse, and when it gets hit, it spreads out like this. And the British Legion took some of those from the Battle of the Somme and put a red enamel dot in the center, and it looks like a poppy. Um, and they made lapel pins out of it. And uh, the lapel pin. We have the lapel That was the hundredth anniversary of the Battle of the Somme. The British Legion is like a VFW and. The American Legion. The American Legion. So we probably Canada has one too. A whole lot more about the book without spoiling it. Because um, <laughs> well, we've given you the setup, and then after that, you should be able to read it. So, um, what's going on with Bess? Will there be a new Bess? Do you have any idea when? I think they're going to wait a year because we want to go to Ireland and do some research. We want to go to Scotland and do some research. We want to go to India and do some research. So.